Clerk, call the roll. Glenn Quickly, County Judge. Here. Roy Charles Brooks, Commissioner Precinct 1. Present. Andy A. Quinn, Commissioner Precinct 2. Here. Gary Vickers, Commissioner Precinct 3. Here. J.D. Johnson, Commissioner Precinct 4. Here. Constitute the court. Thank you. Our invocation today will be delivered by our own Craig Maxwell, an auditor's office. After the invocation, please remain standing for our pledge. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Good morning, Judge, Commissioners, go by our head. Lord, you are our Creator and our Redeemer. You give us strength and wisdom to meet today's challenges. We know that no matter what comes our way, you are with us. Let us show kindness, compassion, and mercy to all, for we are all God's children. Let us keep the faith that you are with us, even in difficult times. Those difficult times we face will measure our endurance and our character. Let us appreciate those who stand up for the oppressed, the weak, and those who protect and defend our freedoms. May they be comforted while they are away from their family, friends, and loved ones. Let us make somebody's day today with a simple act of kindness. We have it in us. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive others who trespass against us. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Mr. Manius. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the court, uh, just a couple of comments as it relates to the agenda this morning. We are going to have two public hearings this morning, one which will consider the county clerk's records archives um, um, program and also that of the district clerks. Also, when we get to the briefing agenda, uh, we're going to have uh, two presentations, and uh, the second one is going to deal with uh, the county's burial program. So we would, at that point, we'll like to have those discussions. We're also going to have a presentation by UNT Health Science Center as it relates to that particular program. And at the end of that, we're not going to ask you to vote on anything, but ask you to give us directions so that we can take action, if necessary, next Tuesday. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Court members, you have before you the minutes of our regular meeting of September the 18th. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. We have several uh, proclamations today, the first of which is a proclamation for Senior Center Month. And I believe Monique, Monique, are you here? Yes. There she is. Y'all come on down. Uh, we've got Monique Marler, CEO, Debbie Duke, uh, Center Operations Coordinator, uh, our own Ann Sawyer Caldwell, who is a board member. Term Tamara, Tamara, Tara Marie Moss is 60 or better, and then Annabelle Luna Smith with uh, Age Friendly Fort Worth. If y'all are here, come on down. There you go. There you go. I'll read this into the uh, record, and then I'll be down there to, uh, to present it to you. Whereas older Americans are significant members of our society, investing their wisdom and experience to help enrich and better the lives of younger generations. And whereas 60 and better has acted as a catalyst for mobilizing the creative energy, vitality, and commitment of the older residents of Tarrant County, Texas. And whereas through an array of services, programs, and activities, 60 and better empowers the older citizens of Tarrant County to contribute to their own health and well-being and the health and well-being of their fellow citizens of all ages. And whereas 60 and Better affirms the dignity, self-worth, and independence of older persons, tapping their experiences, <coughs> skill, and knowledge 
and enabling their continued contributions to the community, be it therefore resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2018 as Senior Center Month in Tarrant County, and be it further resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, call upon all citizens to recognize the tremendous contributions of the Senior Center participants in the outstanding efforts of 60 and better staff and volunteers who work every day to change the perception of aging and create important community resources for older adults to live with purpose, independence, and dignity. In witness whereof, we have here to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 25th day of September 2018, and I'll move its approval. Second. second. That motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes <coughs> unanimously. <coughs> Most of us on this diet so pure qualified. One is not. And Judge, I believe that there are some senior center people in the audience. Not stand up also, please. <laughs> Great group of folks. First, I'd like to uh, thank the judge um, and show much appreciation for allowing us to be here this morning to celebrate with you our Senior Center Awareness Month. Your support of 60 and better and, our res and your responsiveness to the needs of our population does not go unnoticed. This morning, we have representatives from various senior centers throughout Tarrant County who have been throughout the month of September celebrating their opportunity to live with independence, dignity, and respect. September is Senior Center Awareness Month and an opportunity for us to highlight those 25 Tarrant County centers and promote healthy and positive images of aging. Our mission at 60 and Better is to empower older adults to live with purpose, independence, and dignity. Founded in 1967 and therefore currently in our 51st year, we strive to end isolation so those in the prime of their life can stay connected, healthy, and active. National Celebration of Senior Centers began in 1979 when Senior Center Week was celebrated in the month of May. We currently collaborate with you, Judge, in the month of May to celebrate Older Americans Month. That concept actually gained support of other aging-focused organizations, the full Senate, and the House Select Committee on Aging. Thanks to the U.S. Conference of Mayors Aging, Texas, uh, aging Task Force, numerous mayoral proclamations celebrated Senior Center Week. In 1985, the National Institutes of Senior Centers was instrumental in achieving the first Senior Center Week pro presidential proclamation signed by President Reagan. In 2007, the National Institutes of Senior Centers, part of the National Council of Aging, designated this entire month of September as Senior Center Awareness Month to give us the opportunity and flexibility in celebrating. We hope that this morning our presence here will remind you of how much we appreciate and support, um, or appreciate your support, and look forward to ongoing collaboration as we move forward. In my first year of uh, being in this role, I've had many exciting opportunities thus far to meet with uh, uh, various members of the, um, of the court, and so I look forward to the opportunity to meet with others. But please continue to keep 60 and better in mind as you consider opportunities for promoting independence and dignity among our older adult population in Tarrant County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Commissioner Brooks, I believe you have uh, the next three proclamations. I do, Your Honor. The first is um, Dyslexia Awareness Month. Please read that into the record. Whereas dyslexia is a language-based learning disability that affects approximately one in five people, regardless of age, gender, race, or socioeconomic status, and whereas neurological in its origin, dyslexic, dyslexia affects the ways the brain processes information and is characterized by difficulties in reading, writing, and spelling, despite normal intelligence. My daughter, my oldest daughter, is dyslexic. So this is going to be a little bit tougher to get through than I originally anticipated. We've got you, Judge. Whereas those with dyslexia benefit greatly from specialized assistance from highly trained teachers, multisensory learning programs, and individualized <clears throat> instruction, and whereas early identification alternative instruction and extra support from friends, family, and teachers can contribute to the success of dyslexic students enjoy in their classroom and life and later on in employment. And whereas we applaud the, applaud the many efforts, the Fort Worth Independent School District, Discovering Dyslexia Tarrant County and Dyslexia Resource Center of Tarrant County, whose efforts have helped students with dyslexia become successful in their current education and future careers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim October 2018 as Dyslexia Awareness Month and urge all citizens to take the initiative to increase public awareness in our community to educate, identify, and support those with dyslexia. In witness whereof, we have here to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 25th day of September, 2018. I move approval. And I second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. I think dyslexia is one example of how a cookie cutter approach <clears throat> to education does not work. You have to meet each student where he or she is and provide the solutions for that child that lead to their educational success. This morning we have to accept this proclamation Sarah Martinez, president of the Dyslexia Resource Center of Tarrant County. Sarah, would you come to the podium and judge, would you join me please? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for issuing this proclamation and allowing me a few moments to speak. Um, uh, Judge Whitley, I was not aware of your family connection, and that just makes the moment even more poignant for me. Um, my husband and I started Dyslexia Resource Center of Tarrant County uh, because he is a dyslexic adult, and I have two dyslexic daughters, um, ages 14 and 10. Um, and as was mentioned in the proclamation, dyslexia is a brain-based issue that makes it hard to learn to read accurately and fluently. Uh, I do wish to emphasize that it affects 
one in five people. So it is entirely likely that we have quite a few dyslexic individuals in the room with us right now. It is a lifelong condition. Kids don't outgrow dyslexia, but with the right support, key skills, and accommodations, they can approve. And that also applies to adult dyslexics. Given the appropriate accommodations, they're able to succeed in career. It is a common learning issue. Many <clears throat> successful people have it, and researchers have been studying it for over a century. I would invite all of you to join us on October 25th, 5.30 to 7 p.m. at the Fort Worth ISD Professional Development Center. We are having a resource fair and meet and greet um, about <coughs> dyslexia and how it impacts our community. This lovely proclamation will be on display and we expect well over 100 people to gather. Um, thank you again for your support. Thank you for the work you do. I will add that we detected um, this at our oldest daughter when she was in kindergarten. And at the time, uh, I was on the child study board and they were the ones that helped do the testing. Uh, they steered us toward a program that was developed by the Scottish Rite and it was called the Horton Bellingham Program. And so we were able, fortunately, we were able to um, enlist the aid of a tutor and so basically from the time that my daughter was in kindergarten, every day Brenda would take her to this tutor after school all the way up through the seventh grade and would get an extra hour. She was what they called a 3D learner. So dyslexia was a part of that process. And we experienced a lot of acceptance and a lot of support as we went through it from the teachers in school you know, you don't think about it, but one of the things that my daughter was taught cursive writing, something which they have done away with, but hopefully will bring back. Yeah. Because when you write cursively, you can't turn the D and the B around. So when cursive writing is a is one thing that helps with that process. Uh, but again, she would struggle. The summer she would catch up and get a little bit ahead. And then she would start school, and by the spring, she was usually behind. And a lot of times, when this goes undiagnosed, you will find that the kids will be told that they've got a great IQ, and so they must just be lazy, and they're not doing those things which they should be doing, and so they get this label. And oftentimes, it's not until junior high that they determine what some of the issues and what some of the causes are from that standpoint. Uh, as was mentioned, there are some very successful folks. And I will tell you that my daughter is very successful. Uh, but she struggled throughout, and she still struggles to this day. And she knows that. So she, the, the thing that we stressed is that she learns differently. It's, it's not a disability. She just learns differently. And through the support of a lot of folks, uh, she, has, you know, she has been able to accept it and realize it and recognize it. And trust me, we are watching it. We're watching for it in our kids, our grandkids, um, because it is one in five people. So, um, you know, it is something to watch for. It's not something to be ashamed of, uh, but something to just realize that, you know, the, the Lord taught us to, to learn a little bit differently in those situations. And I hope that everyone will take advantage of this October the 25th and, uh, and do whatever you can to help in that particular process. Thank you very much for being here today. Judge, most of us on this bench have served together for a long, long time. And sometimes we think we know pretty well everything about each other. But we don't. We are here, though, however, to support each other. And... Uh, 
we support you this morning. Thank you very much. Next. Next is a vitally important issue. No matter where you stand on the issues of today, and it is National Voter Registration Day. So would you read that one into the record, yes. please, Your Honor? Whereas on September the 25th, 2018, Americans will celebrate National Voter Registration Day with a massive 50-state effort to register voters before Election Day this November, and whereas founded in 2012, National Voter Registration Day is designed to create an annual moment when the entire nation focuses on registering Americans to exercise their most basic right, the right to vote. More than two million Americans have registered to vote on this day since the inaugural National Voter Registration Day in 2012. And whereas public information and education regarding voter registration will encourage citizen registration and civic engagement in the election process. And whereas Americans can register at hundreds of events across the nation and online on nationalvoterregistrationday.org, supporters can also follow National Regi Voter Registration Day activities through social media on September 25th by searching the hashtag National Voter Registration Day now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Commissioner's Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim September the 25th, 2018, as National Voters Registration Day across Tarrant County, further to assist voters in registering and updating their current registration, the Elections Department will have a presence today at every courthouse in the county. In witness whereof, we have here to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 25th day of September, 2018. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Let me just add that voter registration, while extremely important, is only part of the equation. And I would add parenthetically that Texas is a state that has one of the lowest rates of voting in the country. So voter registration, while important, is not all of the equation. The other half is getting up off your butt and going to the polling place and voting. Registration is a tool that helps get us to the prize, which is to vote. So, uh, Mr. Hyder Garcia, our elections administrator, please meet me at the program. And, the, you know, the, the other thing that I will just add to that is there are a lot of folks over the history of this country who sacrificed their lives so that we have this right to vote. And I hope that you will register and then get out and vote. Um, first, I'd like to thank all five members of the court. When um, I mentioned that this was the day to be celebrated today nationwide, all five of you unanimously um, made available your resources and time and everything that was necessary to make sure our presence today uh, at every courthouse was, was possible. So thank you for that. Um, and that thank you comes um, on behalf of all my staff. Um, I'm, I'm the one that has to be here because they're out there helping people register, but the, this message goes... Uh, comes from them. Um, the only thing I would add and stress out for the public who's watching this and for anybody here uh, to 
please help us put out the word is that it's extremely important not only to register to vote, but to update your registration. If you have moved, if you have changed your name, if there's anything in your registration that has changed, it is important that you update it. Um, you can call our office, you can visit our website to check your current registration and see if there's anything. And if you have questions, just call our office. We'll be glad to um, walk you through it over, over the phone and make sure that everything that needs to be in place for you to cast your ballot on November 6 is actually taken care of ahead of time. The deadline to register is two weeks from today, October 9. So it's, there's plenty of time for everybody to check the registration, um, get a registration card and mail it back to us in time if necessary. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And finally, Your Honor, and thank all of you for your patience this morning. There's a lot going on in September and October. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, and that's an issue that is near and dear to me my heart for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that I'm a prostate cancer survivor. So please, would you read that proclamation into the record? Whereas prostate cancer consti constitutes 20% of all male cancer diagnosis and 10% of all male cancer deaths, and whereas in Texas an estimated 12,600 new cases of prostate cancer and an estimated 1,830 deaths will occur in 2018. And whereas African American men, men with a family history of prostate cancer, and men exposed to Agent Orange are at the highest risk, and whereas prostate cancer is the second most diagnosed cancer in American men only behind skin cancer, and the second leading cause of cancer death in men behind lung cancer, and whereas this year approximately 164,690 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in the United States, that's one, that's one man every 3.2 minutes, and roughly 29,430 will die this year from the disease, which is one man every 18 minutes. And whereas one in nine men are diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime, African American men are the highest risk for the disease with a rate of one in seven men. African American men are also 2.1 times more likely to die from the disease. And whereas prostate cancer not only affects men but also affects their families and friends, whereas education regarding prostate cancer and early detection strategies are critical to saving lives, preserving and protecting our families, and whereas all men are at risk for prostate cancer, the citizens of Tarrant County are encouraged to increase their personal awareness of prostate cancer and of the importance of prostate <coughs> cancer screenings. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Commissioner of Court of Tarrant County, do hereby proclaim September 2018 as Prostate Cancer Awareness Month in Tarrant County. In witness whereof, we have herein to set our hands and cause the seal of Tarrant County to be affixed this 25th day of September, 2018. Move approval. Second. Second. <clears throat> Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Although I am a prostate cancer survivor, my brother was not. He died four years ago of prostate cancer. That's why this issue is so important to me. That's why we at Precinct 1 every year do a <coughs> prostate cancer education and screening event that is free to the community. That's why I pushed so hard to get prostate cancer screening into the annual health assessment that our employees go through so that the men who work for Tarrant County will have 
that available to them <coughs> when they get their other health assessments. Prostate cancer is not something that you need to die from. If it's diagnosed early, then you have options for treatment and you have options for living. To me, it's a question of do you want to live or do you want to die? So this morning, to accept this proclamation, we've got Wolfram Bladner, the president of the North Texas Prostate Cancer Coalition, Gail Wilkins from Texas Health Resources, Monty Knapp from the Prostate Cancer Coalition, Dale Albrightson from the Prostate Cancer Coalition, and Dan Davis. Uh, I don't know whether Dan is here or not, but no. Would, would you guys and lady meet me at the podium? And we also have in the audience Dr. Keith Argenbright, the head of the Moncrief Cancer Center, who will be giving a presentation during the briefing session on our last prostate cancer screening event. Keith, why don't you join us as well? I will state, I mean, Commissioner Brooks mentioned his brother. I lost my father to prostate cancer in 1991. So it's been 27 years ago, and he was only 66 uh, at the time. Y'all gather around. Okay, get up there. I know you're twitching. Get up there and yeah, put it where it belongs. It's not in the right place. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Brooks, and thank you, Commissioner Scott. The proclamation it was just read includes statistics that all men and women should become aware of. The purpose of presenting this proclamation is to use this opportunity and platform to address town county citizens, both men and women, who are watching or will watch the video of this meeting. Citizens should be aware of this disease so they can discuss it with a doctor. Its occurrence can be detected and monitored by a simple blood test. Awareness and early detection still are the key to defeating this disease. I'm a survivor of 13 years. I brought another survivor 15 years. I brought a uh, medical professional, and I brought a big supporter in Thai Man. Um, we know this is a small group, but it's a part of a much bigger group. I know there is a uh, commissioner in here who is part of the uh, bigger group. There is a doctor behind me who is part of a bigger group as a survivor. 
Wives, mothers, and daughters are a major part of this group because they too become part of the new normal when a husband, son, brother, or father is diagnosed. All members of this group have had their lives touched by this disease, including with the long-term survivors are members of the medical community, acquaintances of survivors and spouses, mothers and children who have lost loved ones uh, to this disease. This disease can strike any man. The internet has a wealth of information on this disease. <clears throat> if citizens want f further information, they can Google North Texas Prostate Cancer Coalition. I also want to uh, announce a uh, free screening coming up, October 20, uh, free screening downtown Fort Worth in connection with the uh, car show run by uh, Wheels for Wellness. Thank you again, members of this court, for the opportunity to raise citizens' awareness of this major health issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I got. Well, we have a few other things that I want before we move on to the uh, to our consent agenda. Uh, it is hard to believe that this year has gone by so fast, but next week. At our uh, October meeting, we will begin and kick off our United Way campaign. So uh, I, or, or, or probably more Ficus's road crew guy, will be out cooking hamburgers downstairs. And so for $8, you can get you uh, a hamburger starting at around 11 o'clock and going till about 1. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is next Friday, Commissioner Fickus, I believe you have your Empowering Seniors event. We do. And it is your 10th? 10th. 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 Yes. Annual Empowering Seniors event. Do you want to say? Yeah, I would like to. Uh, I, I'm sorry our seniors just left, but um, anyway. <laughs> uh, next Friday at the uh, Campus West, we're having our what we call Empowering yeah. Seniors. And this is our 10th year, and in 10 years, we have served over 20,000 seniors with the services that we provide at Empowering Seniors. We have professional health screenings. We have informative workshops. We have an Ask the Doctor panel that goes on a good part of the day. Uh, we have free food, uh, entertainment, over 150 exhibitors, and it uh, goes on from, I think, 9 o'clock to 1.30. And it's a great time. It's all free, okay? Free dinner, free lunch, free coffee, whatever. Um, come, have a great time. And uh, I know we have we have some sponsors here in the room. I know the the uh, Moncrief Cancer Institute, and I want to thank y'all uh, again. And uh, we there's I'm sure there's a num a number of others here, but uh, it, it'll be a great time. And if you're a not just a senior. But if you're a caregiver or a boomer, which we, if you're my age and a little younger, you know what that is, quite a bit younger, uh, or senior, there's something there for you. So thank you. <clears throat> and finally, yesterday, Commissioner Johnson, I believe, became a great grandpa. That's correct. Congratulations. That is uh, that is absolutely fantastic. Being a grandfather is uh, is a lot of fun. I can just imagine how much you can spoil a great grand. Now, is it a uh, was it a boy or a girl? Boy. Wyatt <laughs> Ellen. Wyatt. Wyatt. Congratulations. Congratulations, sir. Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, now, you have before you the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Mr. Manius, um, or we could, we might go ahead and do the public. I was wondering if it might be possible to move the two briefing items up 
just because I know those folks are so excited about setting through the rest of our meeting. Um, Absolutely, Your Honor. If you'd like to do that, we can. Okay, I'm going to do it right after we do our public hearings. That gives you a couple of minutes to, uh, if you weren't ready, to get ready. Um, I believe we have two public hearings today. Um, Ms. Garcia, would you like to begin? I think yours is the first one up. Good morning, court. Good morning. We are asking the commissioner's court to receive and file our 2019 preservation and restoration plan. It's um, been distributed to you. We, um, we're moving forward. We got a lot of records. We do a lot of digitization. We do a lot of preservation. Um, and we have a plan before you, and I feel comfortable with it, and I hope you will look forward to approving it so we can continue to preserve our records and use technology and harness that technology and spend our money wisely when we digitize and push records out and maintain the integrity of those records and protect citizens with those important information that we need to keep back from the public when we do push things out to the um, internet. So at this time I will open the public hearing and ask if there's anyone here wishing to um, speak to this annual plan. There appearing to be none, then I will close the public hearing and um, take action as y'all would see fit, and that would be, I guess, to adopt the plan. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Wilder. Yes, Judge. Good morning, Judge and Commissioners. <coughs> We, too, ask that you uh, receive, file, and approve the district clerk plan uh, on the special budgets. Uh, I would add that we have been very fortunate to have a fee that the Supreme Court uh, motivated the legislature to pass that actually pays for these old records to be preserved. Um, we are in the process of scanning all of these. There was never a backup. Uh, these records are extremely historical in nature. We have uh, signatures of all the old-time outlaws. Uh, we've got Bat Masterson. We've got just about anybody that you want to have. Um, believe me, we are taking good care of those records, and this is, does not come out of the general fund. It comes out of that dedicated fund that's fed by a court fee. So I would ask you to approve the district clerk plan for these I'll open the public hearing at this time and ask if there's anyone here wishing to speak to this matter. There appearing to be none, then I will close the public hearing. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Tom. Mr. Manion. Oh, uh, nope. We're going to go to our <coughs> briefing item. So shall we do the briefing item? Sure, please. Great. Okay. Members of the we can go to item A. On the, on the briefing. This is a presentation concerning Healthy Lives Matter prostate screening event. Uh, Dr. Argan Bright is here to address the court at this time. Before he begins, let me tell you a little bit about the Healthy Lives Matter Thank you. prostate cancer screening event. <clears throat> It is a, uh, it's an initiative of our Healthy Lives Matter program. It's held annually over Valentine's Day weekend. That is a deliberate choice because men may not be so willing to Roland come Charles. and get... Oh. I'm County Commissioner for Tarrant County Precinct 1. Well, we'll have she stopped. Okay, can there you we go. go. Now we got it stopped. Men may not be so willing to come get screened on their own. So we ask women that love men to bring them to this event. It is a half-day event. For the women who bring their men, we give them red roses, it being Valentine's Day weekend. Everybody gets breakfast. Everybody gets a, uh, well, the men are separated into a uh, different grouping, and they get education about what 
prostate cancer is and about their risk factors and what can be done. Uh, the last several years, we've had uh, Dr. Argenbright and Vinnie Tanaja as our, our subject matter experts. Um, the day also includes uh, nutrition and cooking classes for the ladies. It includes breakfast and lunch. And our sponsors, since this is a free event and no tax dollars involved, our sponsors are Cigna, Aetna, Texas Health Resources, uh, Inspiring Institute of Praise Church, JPS Hospital, the North Texas Prostate Cancer Coalition, SBL Architects, the, te the Texas Rangers Baseball Club. Uh, prostate cancer is a, an init a national initiative of Major League Baseball. The Frisco Rough Riders and Iglesia Bautista Victoria in Cristo, which is a Hispanic church in our community. I want to thank Dr. Argenbright for always being there for us, for making himself available, his facilities available, and now you can run that tape. <laughs> I am Roy Charles Brooks. I'm County Commissioner for Tarrant County Precinct 1. Commissioner Brooks and the team came up with the idea that we need to raise awareness about prostate cancer in our community, and that's how we all got together and uh, this idea got formulated. I'm Wolf from Bletna. I'm currently uh, president of the North Texas Prostate Cancer Coalition. I'm a survivor and I have been surviving for 12 years. Prostate cancer does not just affect the African American community, it affects the Latino community at a higher rate as well. So we want to thank Dr. Valencia for all of his outreach and helping us to get our message out to the Latino community. Let's give him a hand. I got involved in its inception with uh, Commissioner Roy Brooks. Thought it was an awesome idea as it relates to keeping our men healthy and uh, getting a track on prostate cancer. So we uh, immediately involved ourselves. My younger brother <clears throat> died of prostate cancer. I was lucky enough to survive because I was diagnosed early enough so that I had options. It's always best to know before you think it's bad. So the goal for this event is really to educate as many people as we can to raise awareness about prostate cancer and offer an opportunity for folks who may not be going to a regular primary care doctor to come get the free screening here and also have some interaction with doctors and nurses who are available to answer any questions. Commissioner Roy Brooks has really been a vocal champion of prostate health prostate cancer. We were honored when he came to the Montreal Cancer Institute several years ago and asked us to be a partner with him in his Healthy Lives Matter campaign. Far better to suffer that indignity for a moment than to die forever for lack of information. One of the things that we are doing with Healthy Lives Matter is we are promoting education to reinforce how important it is to get screened before those symptoms appear. I learned that you can survive prostate cancer. It's a matter of having the information early enough to give you the option to choose <coughs> life over death. Uh, Your Honor, uh, Commissioners, thank you for having me today. I'm Keith Argenbright. I'm the uh, director of the Moncrief Cancer Institute. And earlier we heard uh, about all the statistics uh, about prostate cancer, and I'm here to tell you uh, uh, and to uh, support the uh, Commissioner Brooks. 
uh, and give you more information about what we're doing about this right here in Tarrant County. Uh, some of you know that I've recently had a personal experience with prostate cancer, so I'm very uh, pleased to report to you the results of our fourth prostate cancer screening event, which is a joint effort between uh, Commissioner Roy Brooks' office, the Moncrief Cancer Institute, and UT Southwestern. Uh, this most recent event, our fourth event, was held on February the 10th, uh, 2018. We had 238 men uh, tested, but uh, as uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, this is an event that also recruits the wives and the families of potential uh, 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 men who should be screened. And so we had over 250, actually 266 um, attendees uh, were there to receive education, counseling, and nutrition. And most importantly, and I think this is a testament to uh, our uh, commissioner's engagement with the community, uh, 40 47 percent of our attendees were African-American. And that's really uh, the, the, the audience that is under-tested, under-treated. Uh, and so we were very, very pleased that we were able to uh, uh, recruit such a high percentage of the African-American community. Um, as I said before, this is the fourth time that we've done this, and every year we continue to grow. Every year we um, get more and more people who come to this. Uh, uh, this year uh, we screened 238. I, I can assure you that if we had 100 times that amount, we'd be able to screen them. And so we are continuing to plan in the future that this will continue to grow and we continue to think about, okay, as this continues to grow, how can we increase our infrastructure so that whoever comes to get counsel or screen will have the ability to do so. We had 13 uh, admirable uh, results this year, and all 13 of those are being navigated to a clinical resolution. Uh, I'm not at liberty to break down how many of those are uh, normal versus prostate cancer, but I can assure you that uh, there's a high percentage of those 13 who were diagnosed with prostate cancer at a stage in which it is uh, treatable and that they will not die of their disease because of our screening efforts. Um, everybody wants to know, well, what's the cost savings of this? Uh, is, are we spending more than what we are getting in return? Um, first of all, the first thing I want you to understand is that when you catch prostate cancer early from a cost perspective, it's much more economic and humane, obviously, but much more economic to treat that cancer at an earlier stage rather than a later stage. It's about 10% uh, uh, more, uh, $18,000 to treat that cancer at a later stage. But the big um, savings comes in the workforce productivity. Uh, as, as, as we've seen before, this is a cancer that strikes men in their prime working years. And so whenever you can get them back into the workforce and you add that to the amount of treatment savings, you amount of, add that to the amount of uh, ER uh, cost savings, uh, you see a total savings there of a half a million dollars per uh, a crop prostate cancer detected. Uh, the cost of the event was about a tenth to that. So we're getting an ROI on this event of about 11 to 1. And so these uh, $44,000 are very, very, very much uh, well invested in the, um, in, in the financial ROI. Here's something I do want to spend just a moment on because uh, there's been quite a bit of controversy in the public health arena about whether we should even be screening them. And uh, my uh, good colleague, Dr. Tanasia, notwithstanding, I, I think that our uh, public <coughs> health service has really created quite a bit of confusion and apprehension uh, with this. And I'm here to, I'm pleased to report it that I believe that the pendulum is starting to swing. Uh, several years ago, um, uh, to the extent that even Medicare was not paying for a routine screening PSA, our commissioner went to our insurance company and said, look, if they work for the for Tarrant County, men deserve to have that paid by their insurance company. And so Commissioner, thank you for your leading and quite frankly visionary efforts in that because it looks as though that the pendulum is starting to swing back now and that the public health community is beginning to recognize the value of uh, screening. Uh, again, uh, thank you to Commissioner Brooks and the Texas Rangers. Uh, the 2019 event is scheduled for Saturday, 
February the 16th. And I hope to see all of the commissioner's court there. I realize that if there are more than three, then we have to make it a, a, a meeting, but I'm sure that there are ways to uh, uh, get around that. And uh, I hope that we will get creative and uh, see all of you there uh, next February. Thank you. I'll be uh, happy to answer, answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Keith, thank you <coughs> for well, I wanna, everything. I want to thank Commissioner Brooks. I never thought about prostate cancer screening, but uh, last year he kind of pressured me a little bit, and somehow my wife got wind of his program. <laughs> and my wife makes sure that I got screened. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Brooks, for what you do. And I appreciate your leadership in this very important issue. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who participates. <clears throat> Don't remember this quarter, we can go to item B. This is the Tarrant County burial program. As we said earlier in the court meeting, we're going to have two different presentations. Uh, let me lay this out first, and then I'm going to ask Julie Parks, our Director of Human Services, to begin the presentations. Uh, we've discussed our burial program and making modifications to the program for several years now, and um, I believe that uh, we, have, we have adequate information and data that will give you a, a, a really good snapshot of what um, uh, what our activities have been for the last several years plus the costs on that. We've been offered a opportunity, a new opportunity actually, from UNT Health Science Center and uh, that we would like the court to consider also. So today what we're going to do, I'm going to ask Julie, if you'll come forward first, we're going to be talking about our current uh, statistical uh, numbers as it relates to our, our program, our cost numbers, and um, and then at that time, uh, after Thank that, you, we'll Jeremy. ask uh, Dr. Reeves from UNT to also address the court. So, this is what we This is the Good morning, court. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Julie. As you know, the the Tarrant County Commissioner Court is required by law to provide for a decedent who lacks the resources to cover the cost of a burial or cremation. And that program is administered by Tarrant County Human Services. And I haven't punched down, have I? There. And so that page. Um, refers to the health and safety code that authorizes the court to provide for indigent <clears throat> persons who are deceased in Tarrant County. This page has some historical data about the numbers that we have served uh, from 2013, as you can see, uh, to the current projections for 2018, uh, the total number served, the number of persons that were buried, and the number of cremations. And uh, uh, you, the costs continue to increase, and the number that we serve continues to increase. Sorry. The next page is uh, looking at 2017 and gives you some information about the um, disposition, um, go, looking at the, the description of those that were buried, uh, the totals, uh, cremations. And, and so finally on that page is um, a number of the total number that were cremated and uh, the number that were buried, and you can see that the total uh, number that of deceased persons that we assisted last year were is 582. Uh, 
The next page shows you the current payment rates, <coughs> funeral homes and cemeteries in Tarrant County are re reimbursed at the following rates that are listed there. For an average adult um, person, it's $1,450, and that is usually paid to $700. Um, for um, a cemetery, one cemetery, we pay a little bit more. For a t we pay a $200 concrete liner, which is required by law. And then we pay funeral homes, 675 and that's what is included in that 1450 for an average burial and then we have the prices there for adult cremation the oversized adult burials and cremations are a little bit more I brought um, before you a potential rate increase We've, um, Tarrant County has received a request from one of, a one of our cemetery providers to increase the cemetery fee for, ad for adult burials from $875 to $1195, which is a 37% increase. And this does include the $200 concrete liner, which this particular cemetery is required to use. We believe that other cemeteries, uh, as well as funeral homes, may would also uh, in request an increase. We haven't given increases or increased the rates to any of the funeral homes or cemeteries since 2010. So we don't really know how many or if the, the others would also request a rate. But this is a cemetery that we use, and they have requested this right so that's something to consider Shirley, you have on there 875 right now right right so if i go back to the previous page i don't see that's the concrete the one that we needs well i know the, the, the one that i see is 1450 and that's the cheapest <clears throat> so how does that relate to the 875 and what's the difference Burial and it's the burial and the funeral home cost, and the rate, the rate increase that we've we've gotten is just from a cemetery, okay. not the funeral home. Okay. That cemetery is the one we pay more to because I think their location requires that they also. Um, have a concrete liner there in and so we pay them more so our current practices or what we do now is when a person um, passes away their family can call of the funeral home of their choice and after they talk with the funeral home the funeral home decides and or determines if that person is indigent and then they will make a referral to Tarrant County for assistance um, they will determine by discussing with them if they are not able to pay for the cost of a burial or cremation so then they refer them back to us, and we also verify and talk with the family. And once they are approved, then the family chooses cremation or burial for their loved one. So in, in 2017, 46% of the families chose cremations. Other referrals come from the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office for those that are unidentified, and these are buried only. It's, we can't, by law, uh, cremate an unidentified person. And then veterans are buried in Tarrant County, and they are also, they, uh, the cemetery is at the DFW National Cemetery at no cost to the county.
on this page, I've included some options to consider. We can consider, can, we can continue as now with an offer cremation or burials and as without considering the increase from the cemeteries or possibly funeral homes, that's $600,000. And we estimate the increase on B that you'll see if we increased the requested uh, cost from the cemeteries, that would be an additional estimation of $110,000. So if we continue with burials and cremations, this gives you an, an idea of the cost. Option C is if we eliminated burials except for veterans and those with no next of kin and those who are unidentified or have cultural or religious prohibitions, and considered, if we eliminated that option and did cremations for adults without those prohibitions, the savings would be approximately 153000 And those numbers are from 2017, and that is an estimate. And then we have um, a collaboration that might be possible with UNT Health Science Center, and they are here right now to talk with us. Uh, I think we would wait and hear their proposal before we looked at any estimated cost savings. <coughs> That's thank you. Okay. So, uh, bringing up the United. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I do, I do want to point out one thing that uh, Julie talked about. To, um, for those that, those that are unidentified, uh, you saw the number of 94. I think that's important to, to remember because we automatically buried the decedents at that point. Um, whenever, if, if we would go with the UNT program, uh, that would remove that aspect and it would be the responsibility of UNT to handle uh, those decedents. So just kind of keep that 94 in, in mind as we as we listen to uh, UNT. Yeah, because they have a, a cold case. Yeah, and they have the ability to actually authorize cremation yeah. of, of undead. <laughs> so with that, to your honor, members of the court, we could ask uh, UNT to come forward. Uh, Dr. Reeves is here to address the commissioner's report on that. He also has a slide presentation. Welcome, sir. Hello. Thank you, John. I want to thank the court for having us here today. And uh, I'm going to, my name is Dr. Reeves. I'm with UNT Health Science Center. I'm the director of the Center for Anatomical Sciences. I'm going to start the presentation, kind of go through and show the court um, what currently the, our Will Body program and our donors that we use our, our bodies in our anatomy programs at Health Science Center, and also kind of to expand that and show how we're also using uh, our donor program uh, across the board in Tarrant County, all the way from middle, uh, high school, education, undergraduate, graduate education, and then training our uh, area clinicians and residents in our county hospital. So we are part of the UNT Health Science Center, and I, again, I'm the, the director of the Center for Anatomical Sciences. Each year we teach around 700 students in the six programs that we have, the six schools we have at UNT Health Science Center, Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine, our graduate school, our School of Public Health, uh, School of Health Professions that has our PA and Physician uh, Physical Therapy program, the UNT College of Pharmacy, and then we have already started our uh, MD school with TCU. We'll have our first students in that program starting next June and July of 2019. So who else will benefit from this program or this proposal that we are proposing today uh, for this burial program? So currently we do a lot of biomedical science research. Uh, graduate students in our master's and PhD programs uh, have current projects with orthopedic um, clinicians at JPS. 
Uh, the gentleman on the left in that left picture you, you see there with the face mask is Dr. Russ Wagner. He's chairman of the orthopedic department at JPS. And that's a project that they're doing with a uh, local company, Medtronics, um, looking at some devices uh, that they're using in knee implants. It's not moving. There we go. Okay, we have in our facility, we've got a bioskills laboratory. Uh, we do a lot of training, um, again, for area clinicians in all the county hospitals here in Tarrant County. Uh, JPS is one of our main uh, groups that come in to do training. We do <coughs> things like knee replacement training, uh, cardiac bypass training, hip replacement, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner there, I've listed just some of the groups um, from JPS. Their orthopedic group, again, is one of our main groups that come in for training. We have OB-GYNs uh, that also come in in emergency medicine, as well as some people from their uh, cardiac units. We also do training with uh, Fort Worth Fire Department and their EMT personnel, as well as neighboring counties, uh, groups from Cleburne, uh, from all around the, the Fort Worth area come in and train. Uh, we do this at no cost to them. Uh, we, we like having those groups come in. We know the importance of those groups the area and to the uh, first line of, of health care here in, in Tarrant County. We also have some other programs that we're involved in, both TCU and uh, Texas Wesleyan University's nurse anesthetist program. Just in the last six months, we've had over 200 students in our facility where we've trained them uh, on their uh, nerve block and different techniques that they're, they're using. Also, both UTA and SMU biomechanics groups come in regularly and do training in our facility. A little delay here. There we go. Let me back up one. Uh, we do a lot of things with uh, Fort Worth ISD. Uh, we have a lot of outreach programs where we bring students in. Uh, we usually go out to elementary schools, but then we also bring in kids to our facility. Uh, from the middle schools and high schools. In the bottom right-hand corner, that's actually a group of high school biology teachers that we had a little training activity where they came in and actually did some dissection in our facility. And those of you that are familiar, I think, on this next slide, um, we have a collaboration with Tarrant County College and UNT Health Science Center and also the UNT uh, Denton campus with a early college high school here in Fort Worth called the Texas Academy of Biomedical Sciences. This is the early college high school. Students uh, receive up to 70 college credit hours in their uh, junior and senior years. It's housed right here on the campus of TCC here in the Trinity campus. We have a week-long uh, summer camp with these kids as they're coming in from the 8th to the ninth grade. And then we also bring those students back on uh, their junior and senior years and we do research projects with them. Uh, the, bottom picture there in the middle that you can see. We do some activities in that camp where they do suture clinics. Uh, they also do a surgical skills uh, event where they scrub up, put on surgical gowns, and then we uh, kind of run them through that. Uh, parents don't tend to like that as much because they have a hard time getting the students out of those clothes for two or three days. <laughs> it's a lot of fun though. We really enjoy having those kids on our campus. This is our new anatomy facility. Uh, just finished about two or three months ago, $2.6 million total renovation. Uh, this facility will hold um, our MD school as well as our osteopathic school, our PA program, and our PT program. Uh, space for all four groups. Uh, beginning here just in the next month, we're starting a million dollar renovation of a new embalming facility and the storage facility as well as a new bioskills lab. And just to point out that last uh, sentence, just everything that we're doing here, again, all the way from our high school programs, all the way up through our graduate programs, uh, involve the medical training for things that are gonna benefit, we think, uh, Tarrant County for a long time. So the last part of this uh, presentation, I'm gonna turn over to our Will Body Program Manager, Claudia Yellett, to go through some of the details of our proposal. Good morning, Court. Good morning. Good morning. This one? Yeah, I think you have one of those. Okay. okay. I'm just going to outline some of the details of our offer here. Um, we're asking the court to consider that rather than the county assuming the charges for the bureau information, 
um, to be able to offer the option of donation to medical education and research through the Will Body Program at UNT. Uh, donors are a valuable resource of medical education, biomedical research, and clinical training activities. Healthcare providers in Tarrant County need these resources for training. Let me stop you just a minute. Yes, sir. You said the option of doing this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, our role in this collaboration would be the removal of the deceased from the place of death, a notification of Social Security death, and filing of the death certificate, just like a funeral home would do for the families. Um, when our training activities are complete, we perform a cremation, and we return the ashes to the family at that time if they choose to have them back. Uh, this would all be at no charge to the family or the county for donors that we are able to utilize for medical education and research. Next slide. Here we go. Uh, donors that are not able to be utilized for medical education uh, would be cremated for a fee of $300 per cremation. Ashes would still be returned to the family or UNT Health Science Center if the family elects not to receive the ashes back. Um, would facilitate a burial at the National Cemetery for those that are veterans that are qualified for burial there or a burial at sea. Uh, minor children under the age of 18 would not be utilized for medical education or research. Those would rather be directly cremated at the same cost to the county. Uh, this collaboration will be a cost savings to the county, but more importantly, it would provide the medical school with valuable material needed to educate and train the health care providers that in turn would provide high quality of care to the members of the community. Um, every year, we hold a legacy of life ceremony that every family that comes through our program, regardless of how they came through the program, is invited to come to. Uh, we usually have about 400 to 450 people right now attend this. Um, it's put on by the students and the instructors at the school, um, and it's just a memorial service to honor the donors that did come through the program. Are you doing this with other counties at this time? Uh, not through UNT. I managed a program at UT Southwestern for 12 years where we facilitated the same program with Dallas County. Okay. Yes. Questions? You mentioned family members. What about those who are unidentified? Uh, we can still facilitate the donation. Um, mm -hmm. We have the, uh, the paperwork and the authority. We work with medical staff or the county staff, however the donation comes to us to facilitate that. Okay. But do we need special permit because they no, don't sir. have a next of kin? No, sir. It's, it's part of the State Anatomical Board, um, which is the board that regulates all donations through medical schools in the state of Texas. Yeah, the state of Texas has authorized medical schools or has given medical schools that authority to take possession of, of the decedents and then either use it for medical research or permission. Well, I think that we have the responsibility to be both compassionate and fiscally responsible um, as long as this program is optional to families I don't suppose I have a problem with it but so I hate for people to be consigned to it as a mandate just because they're poor so GK what is what's the what, where are we at right now on the program Okay, so current, you, you heard Julie give the presentation as to where we are currently. And uh, let, uh, let me get over to those, to that page on the PowerPoint. We found that this program works very well in, uh, in Dallas County. One of the concerns that we had at staff level was the religious aspects because there's various religions that, uh, that uh, do not uh, consent or approve of cremation. And we want to make sure that we, we honor those, those beliefs. And we've had conversations with UNT <coughs> to ensure that whenever there is a decedent who is, who is part of the religious group, that those individuals would be buried rather than cremated. Uh, there may be some times where a family may have a conscientious type uh, objection to cremation and we'll need to work with those families 
However, it's going to be important, my understanding is, with a UNT contract, that the vast majority of the, uh, the students go into the UNT program. There is, uh, we, you know, we talked about this earlier, probably a couple of years ago, where we brought this program to you, and it was not economically feasible for us to do it because it was driven mainly from UT Southwestern, and um, and and we wanted to make sure that if we had to see them here, that they went to our medical schools, and so right how now, how do we how do we assure that that majority of, of persons? choose this option you just said that it would only work if if a majority of the decedents right uh, yeah. took, uh, took advantage of the program I, how do you how do you make that work well i think that that one of the things is that if you have a death and when it goes directly to the funeral home rather than then allow unt to coming to the picture at that point, uh, you've almost passed a decision point as to are you going to use burial or cremation. And so it's an option that the family has, and in many cases, or not in many cases, in some cases we find that, um, that the decedent may very well be indigent, but there's monies that the family has to bury. And so if they choose not to, not to cremate, then, then those additional costs could be passed on to the families, but it's 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 something that that's an easy decision, quite frankly, for a lot of the families if they don't have to pay anything because the decedent is is indigent, or at least cl the family claims that uh, that there's no money to be had to uh, to to bury. So, at what point? Will this counseling take place, and who's going to do it? Well, the it, it currently happens at the funeral homes, and and we have yeah, some. Yeah, but we're bypassing that. Well, and and we and I would imagine that that would be something that we would have to work out with UNT. Um, I still go back and remember I, I brought up the ninety four uh, people that were well, unidentified. And, and I guess that's the question because if it's happening at the funeral home, like you said, that's all we've already passed. We've already. It's, it's, it's almost past that. It's day. almost past the decision right. making. At the point in time of the death, if we're turning that over, talk to me a little bit how you did this in Dallas County from a perspective of, I'm assuming, at that, upon death, it, it, UT Southwestern would have stepped in. Will that be when UNT would step in and then they would have communications with the family with regards to what's fixing to happen? Yes, sir. The families were referred to us by uh, Dallas County or by the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office when they expressed a need, a financial need. Um, they were referred to UT Southwestern Medical School at that point. That's when we counseled and educated the family on what this option was. And at that point, they had the option to take advantage of it or go to a, a funeral home and handle mm -hmm. it privately amongst the family. And where's the body at that time? Um, usually still at the medical facility, the home. We're referred by a lot of means in Dallas County. A lot of hospice groups already have our information. So a lot of times we're actually being contacted before a death even occurs to kind of educate the family on the process. Okay. And so if a family then, let's say under that scenario, a family comes in and says, okay, wait a minute. What you're saying is if they say we're object that we have an objection based upon religion or whatever the case may be then at that point in time the reference is made to a funeral home and then that process that part of the process would take place yes sir uh, at that point okay with the 94 no no next of kin so essentially these individuals deceased individuals would have no one to speak on their behalf Right. And, and uh, is that a default position that their body will be donated to? Is that, that what my understanding yes. yes, based on yes. the current law, that is the option that would be given. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, that's not, you say an option, there's nobody to speak for that person. Right. So I, I'm, I'm referring to that was the option that was offered by the county. Yeah. Okay. We currently get some from the ME's office that way already. Yeah. 
And right now, if there's no known next of kin within Tarrant County, we're cremating? We're burying. It's a burial. There's no one to authorize a cremation. So they are not cremated. They'll, they'll but if, they, if UNT was in this deal, then they have the ability to... To authorize the cremation. Right. Right. That's, that's, that's where our state is going to board. Board. We, we have all the right yes. The, the university has greater authority than the county does when it comes to this situation, simply because the state has granted them that authority. And I'm, I'm guessing that in 90% of the time, again, there are no next of kin, you do not have any information, but if you ascertain <coughs> information that would lead you to believe that they were of a, lig a religion that did not go along with cremation, what is your procedure at that point in time? Um, I can only speak from my experience of running the program in Dallas, and in the 12 years we were never contacted by anyone who had a religious objection to cremation. Um, those religions typically already have funeral homes and cemeteries they work with, they have tight-knit community ties, so they never made it to the county level. Um, if that was ever expressed to us, uh, again, the option to have them go to the funeral home would be what was presented. And, and, what our, our, and we would, would deviate somewhat from what Dallas County is currently doing because whenever we have those situations where it's identified as a, on a religious basis, we would like our human services department to step back in right. and handle that, that aspect of it. That way we know that, our, that we'll will have some input into that. It very well mean, may mean that we will expend some money for burial, but um, we believe that's the right thing to do. So you're not asking for any action this week? No, we would like, but, but what we would like to do is Put to get some type week. of direction from the court because because if, if, if the commissioner's court is, is amenable to move forward with with the UNT proposal or a slight modification of that proposal, which we just talked about where human services steps in and assists those that uh, may have religious or <clears throat> cultural uh, preferences, then we will bring back a document next week for your approval. And, and I, for one, I, mean, I, I want to be sensitive to that, but I also, having or being a member of the Board of Regents, understand how critical and how important this is to our medical students and to the folks who are training to be our physicians and, uh, and various healthcare professionals and providers in the future. Now, I just mentioned something that I, I have been told in the past that the only time I have a conflict up here is when I personally um, stand to gain an equivalent of more than 10% of my income. And I see that frown on your brow, but that's what I was told by district attorney's office previously. So if there's going to be any question about whether I can vote on this, because I am on the UNT Board of Regents, then I need you all to research that in the next week and make that determination and let me know one way or another whether I can vote uh, for this. If I were on the UNT board, I would tell you they won't let me vote on certain things when Tarrant County comes up, but that has never been the situation up here as it pertained uh, to any yeah, board. We'll, that need, we we'll need the district attorney's office to take a good look at that, and and that's why we didn't take any, not requesting any actions today. But if the court, if you want us to move forward with this or a modified version, which we've discussed, Hold at on. least for your present. Your consideration next Tuesday, we will. And okay. Yeah, I think we should. It's, it, it, to me, it looks like a win-win situation for everybody. Okay. On the um, the barrier adult, according to the number presented by Julie here, we have 150 in uh, FY17. Okay. 156. Maybe 180. 150, 100. Very so These individuals. They have family members, and then family member would directly authorize the donation, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. So in this scenario, um, as long as the 
process is objective, presenting only the fact, options, not trying to sway the family in any one particular direction, then I would be in support of this. Okay. The 94, <clears throat> no, no, next of kin. I might have some ethical concerns about that. Okay. Because these individuals, they have deceased. And I'm not sure if any of us, including the state, have the right to take control of their body. Additionally, based on my experience in the past, these individuals will be buried and their graves are marked. And then sometimes in the future, unknown to us, their next of kin would eventually trace back and be able to find them and their graves. So I don't know if this particular category of individuals is something that requires a little bit more thoughts. Okay. okay? It's just because they don't have any next of kin, it doesn't mean they are, they have no voice. Would it not be feasible <clears throat> on the group that Commissioner Wims is talking about that you're going to cremate these bodies when, when you're complete. Uh, and what do you do with those ashes if it is um, no next of kin? I mean, do you have facilities to keep them for a period of time in case somebody does come and, and contact our, you know, the county 10 years later, five years later, and say, you know, what happened to Uncle Joe? And, uh, you know, w w so, you know, they might be able to then be given, you know, an urn with those ashes. And, and I don't know that you keep them in perpetuity, but I think a, a reasonable amount of time. And again, that's at the county's discretion. With Dallas County, there was a set amount of time that we held on to unidentified mm -hmm. ashes. If the families came forward, they were given those ashes. Okay. I'd like to ask concerning the 94 who are listed as no known next of kin, how many of those are actually no known identity? We don't know who the heck we'll, they we'll, are. We'll need to get that information. We don't have that at this time. We'll get that by next week. If you do not, well, let me ask, I'll, then I'll ask this question, because I also know you've got the cold case department yes, there. In the forensic I'm, I'm assuming that then if someone <clears throat> dies of natural causes and you don't have an identity on them, they would not necessarily end up in the um, in that department of unidentified because that's more of a cold case than it is a someone just died of natural causes. Right. Is that is that, that that's I true, don't see I see you saying right but I don't see well, right if, on his face. If the, if the county wanted we could work something out with that department to where we could pull a, a DNA sample run a profile and then keep that stored to where there would always be a, a genetic identity of that individual to where if there was a match at one point, a family member came forward and said, you know, we don't know what happened to our loved one. Is there any record? We could always pull that record up and, and be able to identify that person that way. That would be easy to do if, if that was something the county would request. So. I, I think that, you know, they're doing it. They are national. Well, I think they are. I know they're nationally known. I think they may be the uh, institution as far as it comes to cold case and DNA recognition and I think there's something else that y'all are just in the process of doing as it pertains to the DNA. Yes. That genetics group used to be in the anatomy department and then we split in the lab but I still I know all the um, chair and all of that group so that would be something that we could easily work out if that was something the county wished us to do. Okay uh, any other questions and we'll put this on the agenda to Come back next week. I agree. I agree. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, shall we move back to our regular business?
I think we're going to take a five minute break before that we come back to our regular meeting. That would be very good. <laughs>
So who did you lose? Okay, Mr. Manius, uh, take it away. a week ago to the administrator section. We have four additional items to bring to you this morning. The first one is a resolution directing, uh, indicating the Tarrant County Commissioner's Court uh, su support, directing the Tarrant County 911 Emergency Services District to provide text to 911 within Tarrant County in an expeditious manner. Move approval. Second. We have a motion or a second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Commissioner Brooks is soon to return. So this is a week ago to item number two. Last week we had a briefing on 911. As we go to, are you okay with the resolution for 911 text. texting as soon as possible? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> There's the vote again, and now it's officially unanimous. So on item number two, we request, as you, as you remember, last week uh, we had a presentation by the 911 um, uh, executive director on their uh, FY19 budget. At this time, we're requesting that the commissioner's court approve the district's proposed FY19 budget. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Members Court, on item number three, we're requesting that the court approve an local agreement between Tarrant <coughs> County and the City of Arlington for participation in the funding of costs related to the creation of a TIF for the International Corridor area in Arlington, Texas. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Members of court on item number four. This is a request from probate court number one. Uh, this is an exception to the travel policy. Uh, Judge King and, uh, and Mr. Sullivan are requesting that they be allowed to attend the 2018 National College of Probate Judges Conference, which is going to be held in mid-November of this year. Uh, it's an out-of-state travel request. Uh, we do have a policy and, uh, and let me read that policy. It's elected or appointed officials who are in the final year of the current term of office or in the final year of their current appointment and who will no longer be an incumbent in that elected or appointed position after the end of the current term of appointment must have prior commissioner's court approval for out-of-region and or educational travel. Uh, Judge King is retiring at the end of this at the end of this calendar year, and so this is going to if if we if there's an authorization for this, this has to be specifically authorized by the commissioner's court. Question: Is this in their budget? Yes, it is. I move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. It's in, his, it's in the budget, but it may affect the new judge in that particular deal. And so, good luck. <laughs> yep. Uh, Ms. Tidwell. Good morning. We have one item this morning we're asking the court to consider, and that is to receive and follow the auditor's report for the review of certain Human Resources Master Data Controls, and you have Human Resources Response, which is for the most part in agreement with our recommendations. So we will work with uh, Human Resources and Information Technology to improve our process of controls as outlined. Be happy to answer any questions. Move to receive and file. Second. We have a motion to second to receive and file. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Ms. Snyder. Special 
We have before you today the final element of the FY19 budget process, and that includes the approval of the special purpose budgets, and we're recommending their approval. So approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Now, wait a minute. Well, there is one more. I understand that. <laughs> That's a recommending of a claim. Uh, I believe that we just passed the last budget that Ms. Snyder will have overseen. Correct. Right. And you started in 1981 doing those, or was it 90? 81 was when I started as the assistant budget officer in the auditor's office. So the first mm -hmm. budget I worked on was 1982. So this is uh, seven, this would be 35? 37. 37. 30, 36 to 30. Well, no, because it's for the, it's it's 19. For the 19. Yeah. I shouldn't be arguing with her about this. Yeah. <laughs> but since my budget has already been approved, yeah. then I'm not as concerned about it. But, Debbie, we cannot tell you how much we appreciate the 37 years you have been doing this. Um, now, she's, I, I'm not sure she's put in the paperwork, but no. she has at least indicated uh, that she will be putting in that paperwork by the end of November. And we are going to miss her greatly uh, in the budget area. And um, my only hope is that we find someone who is as um, tenacious. That's a good word. That was, I, I was thinking of a little shorter number of letters, but I, I think that, you know, uh, uh, just a couple of things. She, she watches those dollars uh, like they were her own, and uh, we have the smallest budget department, I think, of any, by far, any of the major urban counties, and that's primarily because when she was saying no to y'all, she didn't feel like she could ever ask for anybody in her particular area. And, and so I think you have led by example for many years, at least for the 22 that I have been on this court. And I can tell you, um, I, am, I am apprehensive about the first sets of budget without you. And I know you've got some good people, and I don't know if Helen's in here or not, but uh, I would all I would say is that uh, I, I never had to worry about when the budget came to us what shape it was going to be in. And I know we, you know, we have people who come up and, and we grant exceptions to that. Um, but we appreciate very, very, very much all of the work you put into these budgets these past 37 years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. to serve not only Commissioner's Court, assist the departments, but the taxpayers of Tarrant County. They've always been important to me, too. But, you know, I've sat in this spot for many, many years, and there's actually a little desk drawer there that's about worthless. So here's a couple of things that have been there in there for a very long time. There's a little ruler that says, let's keep County Judge Mike Moncrief. <laughs> And it's got a, a 1982 calendar on the back of it. <laughs> we moved into this building in Labor Day of 81. Um, the other is an Emory board. And on the back of it, it says, we're supporting Lynn Gregory for Commissioner of Precinct 3. So predates Commissioner Hampton. Yeah, Hampton. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Yeah. So I've worked with many, many court members all the, over, over the years. It, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's weird. And who's your favorite commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer that question. No, we have an it easy, may affect your retirement. We, 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 <laughs> we kind of do that.
had it at home with my nieces and nephew, who's your favorite aunt, and we're all trained to say we love you all just the same. <laughs> And don't forget the, the second one you got. Oh, I have the second one. <laughs> Poor Mr. Edwin Rivera. Uh, the risk management board is recommending the payment of claim to Mr. Edwin Rivera and the amount listed on your court communication. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. <clears throat> Good morning again, Good morning. Your Honors. Good morning. Uh, I have three items today for your consideration and approval. The first one is the approval of additional appointments of county election judges and alternate election judges. This is uh, an appointment of judges uh, for vacancies that were not filled on July 31st when we brought the first list for your consideration. Move no approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. The second item I bring is the approval of uh, the early voting sites for the November 6th election. Um, we have a total of 41 permanent locations and eight temporary. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. The last item is the approval of election day polling locations. Um, in your packet, do you have a list of the locations proposed together with uh, detailed description of the changes in the, compared to November 2017? Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ms. Glenn. Move to receive and file personnel agenda. Second. We have a motion second to receive and file personnel agenda. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We have uh, three additional items for the court. The second item, we're asking the court to approve an out of, uh, actually two out of class pay extensions for the tax office. Uh, Mr. Wright is requesting, as I indicated, two out of uh, class pay extensions. Uh, they are detailed in your court communique. If approved, they will be, be effective September the 29th. We're estimating the cost of the general fund to be a little bit more than $3,500, and that does include fringe benefits. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three, we're asking the court to approve TO changes to the sheriff's uh, office. As described in your court communique, this is really a two-part request. The first part uh, is that we are proposing, or the sheriff's office is proposing, to move its courtesy patrol from the law enforcement system to the non-law enforcement system. This will affect 19 positions and four position titles. The second part of the request is a request for four new positions. These are all grant-funded positions, the four new positions. So the impact to um, the grant um, fund would be approximately $278,000, and that would uh, include fringe benefits. So that doesn't include any uh, general fund money from no, the sir. County? No, sir. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And then our last item, we're asking the court to approve a double fill as well as a waiver for the uh, civil district courts. Uh, we have an auxiliary court coordinator who will be leaving county service, and in part this re uh, request will allow her replacement to train with her before she leaves. We're estimating the cost to the general fund to be a little bit more than $3,000, including fringe benefits. <coughs> Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And Judge Thank Whitley, you. if you would allow me just to, to supplement your announcement about United Way, the kickoff, um, in, conjunction, in conjunction with the judges' uh, kickoff event, we are going to be hosting our uh, annual employee health fair. And so we want to make sure that all of our employees, after you get your delicious meal from the judge's office, swing by our uh, booths. We'll have our insurance carriers present. We'll have other health care vendors. We'll have the Y present. We'll have giveaways. And we'll also have our great DJ that we've had for the past couple of years. So we're going to pray for good weather, have a good meal, and get some good feedback on our health. Thank you very much. I had Thank meant you. to do that, so I appreciate very much you doing Robin that. Robin reminded me. Thank you, 
Chris. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Honor, our court members. We have uh, one item this morning for your consideration. Um, we, uh, we are requesting uh, that the Commissioner's Court approve an Adobe Sales Order Addendum for RFO number 2016-056, uh, Adobe Sales Order for um, Adobe Managed uh, Services for Information Technology with uh, Adobe Systems Incorporated. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Um, this goes back like a couple years ago, three, two years ago. Yes, sir. Um, so one of the uh, purposes of uh, one of the things that this addendum addresses, uh, Commissioner, is actually a good problem that we have. Uh, if there's something like a good problem, when we first did that engagement, we we knew that citizens and residents of Tarrant County would be uh, using a lot more of web services because our website was not very usable. Well. <clears throat> Even our best anticipated increase uh, did not fix the problem. We saw a surge of the use of uh, web services in a manner that we had just not in a way we could have uh, anticipated. And so there were some overages. We were busting up over 3 million versus about 2 million uh, unique visits that we anticipated. And uh, one of uh, the things that this uh, addendum does is address that problem so that we are not charged with overage. It, we are increasing the volume now to 4 million. And uh, we, I hope that it moves up to 10 million. That just means that uh, there are shorter lines, I hope, uh, in services, uh, you know, people working into uh, our service windows here at the county. They're not charging us anything additional or anything that we're, that this is being paid? Uh, during this period, as a matter of fact, during this period, one of the uh, items in this engagement is that uh, during this period uh, of, uh, that we are getting this addendum approved, uh, they will waive uh, any overages uh, that, uh, that will occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Benny. Good afternoon, Your Honor and members of the court. Uh, we have uh, three items before you today, but before I begin, I'd like to quickly introduce uh, two of our public health physicians that are in court with me today. Uh, first of all, you know Dr. Catherine Colquitt. She's our medical director. Do you want to stand up real quick? And uh, the second person we have is Dr. Kenton Murthy. Uh, he's been with us for a few months. He's our assistant medical director. Um, the uh, first... Yeah. <laughs> Please. Um, the first two items actually pertain to these folks, so I uh, wanted to make sure you know who they are. Uh, first item, we're requesting approval for the reappointment of uh, Dr. Catherine Colquitt as the Tarrant County Local Health Authority. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, second item is requesting approval of the appointment of Dr. Kenton Murthy as the Tarrant County Deputy Local Health Authority and the Local Rabies Control Authority. Move approval. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, third item, we're requesting approval of the Public Health Fiscal Year 2019 fee schedule. And uh, the effective date of this fee schedule would be October 25th to allow us time to notify the public. Move approval. Second. second. A motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Jack? We get the caps up? No, I'm not even messing with caps. I kind of like the podium further back. You can better see my fair catch signal. I have no bold predictions today except the best losing team will win Saturday. <laughs> That's not very funny, Jack. I, I know. We have not had any free consideration this morning. My three teams won again this morning. <coughs> Sir? My three teams won again this morning. <coughs> Good choices. 
Nine items. The first item is a bid award recommendation for bid 2018-150. This is a purchase of uh, data domain 7200 upgrade for the Information Technology Department. Recommendation to award the low bidder, Thomas Galloway Corporation, in the amount of $71,000. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number two is another bid award recommendation for bid 2018-151. This is a bid for the purchase of additional uh, VX block storage capacity. Recommendation be to award the low bidder Presidio Network Solutions Group. The amount of $388,491.76. Approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three, also a bid award recommendation for bid 2018-159. This is a contract for SAP Consultant Services. Recommendation be to award a pre-enterprise basis, awarding to the primary, secondary, and alternate vendors as shown in your corporate communique. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Item number four, also a bid award recommendation for bid 2018-168. Uh, this is our new contract with the purchase of dump trucks and haul trucks. Recommendation be toward a pre enterprise basis, awarding to the three primary bidders who shown in your court communique. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Number five. Also a bid award recommendation for bid 2018-186, saying a contract for pre-employment polygraph services for the Sheriff's Department. Recommendation be toward a printed price basis, awarding to the four primary bidders as shown in the court communique. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Number six, bid award recommendation for bid 2018-187, annual contract for PM repair of our air compressors. Recommendation to be to on a parade price basis, awarding to a company called MS Air Incorporated. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Number seven, bid award recognition for, for bid 2018-192. This is a new contract for welding equipment, supplies, and industrial medical gases. Recommendation to be to award a parade price basis. Selecting as our primary vendor, a new vendor, uh, Prax Air Distribution, our secondary vendor, Air Gas USA. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Number eight is an item in regards to bid 2018-162. This is a contract for lumber and building materials. Uh, we received one uh, bid. Uh, he, they did not uh, fill out half of the... the uh, Categories required. We are recommending rejection of that one bid and suggesting that we rebid with revised specifications. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Our last item, number nine, uh, item in regards to bid 2015 207. This is our new contract for monitoring services uh, consisting of burglary fire safes for facilities management. We're requesting a 60 day contract extension. Uh, the only bid that we received did not sign the addendum. Uh, this time of the year, we'd like to extend it for 60 days. Um, come back next week with a recommended uh, rejection and rebid. So you're asking for no action? Yes, sir. Bye. Thank you. Are there any appointments? There being none, then you have before you the claims, including the addendum? Move approval of the claims, including the addendum. Second. We have a motion to second to approve the claims, including the addendum. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. And there are, we've already done our briefing items. So, so we do have a closed session today. Your okay. With that, then, I will recess our open meeting to proceed to close to discuss items exempted under section 551.071072074076 and 087 of the Texas Government Code. We're going to do the housing finance after we address the following matters. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the Court, a week ago to item 9J9, under, this is under the Purchasing Department. <coughs> This concerns bid number 2015-027. We're requesting that the court approve a contract extension on that particular bid. It's the annual, mon annual contract for monitoring services for facilities management with interface security systems on a month-to-month -month basis. 
Uh, we estimate that the a new RFP will be in effect uh, sometime mid to late November. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. That's all we have this time, Your Honor. With there being no further business, we're adjourned. <coughs>